Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 28th of March, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So already almost the end of March, guys. It's crazy how fast time goes, right? We're almost in April, almost time for the uh, Ethereum conferences around Amsterdam. I was actually just looking at all the ones that I was going to attend today. And I am super, super excited. Uh, you know, just a bit of an, a, an alpha leak, I guess. Um, the ones that I'm, I'm probably going to attend are ETH Day, the Staking Gathering, Layer 2 Amsterdam, Shelling Point, the ETH Amsterdam Hackathon, and MEV Day. There's... Oh man, there's so many events happening around DevConnect in in Amsterdam. It's going to be basically impossible to get to all of them, but those are the ones that I think I'm going to be at. No. I'll post that in the Discord channel when I'm more kind of like finalized around that. But I was just looking at it all today and thinking, you know, I want to go to these one sort of thing. And I messaged some of the organizers at uh, ETH Amsterdam and was like, you know, how can I get involved here? So I think I'm going to be a judge uh, for the ETH Amsterdam hackathon uh, and maybe be on some panels there. I'm doing a talk at the staking gathering run by ETH Staker, already confirmed there. And there might be other things that I do as well. So I'm super pumped for that. But I'll talk more about that as kind of like we get closer to the to the dates there. One thing I wanted to talk about before we jump into the news is how good is this recent price action for ETH, right? You guys know that I don't like focusing on price too much, but I think like unless we come down from here, I think it like uh, it's it's just a very positive place to be. You know, just kind of like looking at where we've come from over the past few months, like how long we've kind of range uh, been range bound for. It's really, really exciting to see that uh, ETH is starting to move up in a really positive way again. Obviously, the narrative around the merge has really started coming into its own. I'm seeing so many people talk about it now. I'm seeing uh, mainstream media cover it, all those sorts of things. Even though the mainstream media gets a lot of things wrong, they're still covering it, which I guess... You know, you could you could argue that's better than 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 them not covering it, uh, and you know, just things feel a lot more positive than they did even a couple months ago, which is which is really really cool. And I think it's it's funny because you have all this positivity going on within the Ethereum ecosystem, within things happening around Ethereum, especially at the core protocol level. But then there's a, there's still kind of like a, a bunch of drama going on. I think. When it comes to things like you know core developer funding, which I discussed last week on on the refuel, and that was a big point. Yeah, that was that was just like a huge point of discussion over the last kind of like week or so. Uh, then you have uh, obviously all the infighting still within the crypto tribes that still goes on. I mean, all this sort of stuff. I don't know. I, I feel like it's it's cycle kind of like um uh it's it's not sensitive to the cycles. I feel like it always kind of like happens uh over over the years. And I think when you kind of like zoom out a bit, you can see periods of time where things kind of like swing one way or swing the other. You know, during the during the uh, 2018 and 2019 bear market, a lot of people swung to towards Bitcoin maximalism because that was kind of like the safe haven for them to be. A lot of people gave up on Ethereum, but then when Ethereum came back in 2020, especially with DeFi Summer and all that, those same people kind of like swung back to to Ethereum. Now, I didn't see anyone kind of like swinging to Bitcoin maximalism lately or anything like that over the past, I guess, like six months, 12 months since we've been in this kind of like range bound thing here. Uh, and that's really positive, I think. I think the, the wind's definitely changed. I think uh, Ethereum really did prove itself to the wider market. And I think that going forward, there's not going to be those kind of like cycles that we're used to. I mean, this this current quote unquote cycle, since if you want to say it started on March 2020, it's definitely been completely different to previous crypto cycles. Uh, you know, I, I think people are coming uh, coming to terms with that and tuning into that and being and realizing that you know it doesn't just go oh okay Bitcoin will pump then ETH will pump and then quote unquote alts will pump. I don't think it's like that anymore. I think things are being more and more separated into their own categories. People are kind of like buying and. And speculating on these things as if that 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 their own thing. Now, don't get me wrong. In times of kind of like a volatility, especially extreme volatility to the downside, everything seems to dump together. But I think I'm talking more on like the month long time scale, kind of like months, few months sort of thing, rather than like the day to day stuff. Uh, I think the correlations are definitely dropping, especially for things that can actually stand on on their own, actually have fundamentals backing it up. I think that's a really positive uh, development I've noticed at least over the last eh, 12 to 18 months, especially over the last 12 months. And, and, you know, especially over the last, I guess, six, but we'll have to see, you know, there's still a lot of crap out there that, uh, that, that, that gets a bid. I mean, uh, I was just looking at kind of like uh, CoinGecko just before Shiba Inu is still number 15, right? I, I don't understand why, but it is. XRP is still number six. Like what, you know, there are still things, Cardano is still in the top 10. There are still things that have like, you know, you, you kind of look at that and you're like, this is super weird. Um, but I think a lot of that is just like kind of like legacy momentum and legacy inertia. And over time, these things kind of get washed out. So we're going to have to see obviously how that plays out. 
over the coming years, especially as this space continues to institutionalize. But that was just a little bit of, uh, I guess, commentary on the markets that I wanted to make. But anyway, enough for the markets, time to jump into the update. So we have the latest all core devs update, uh, number 10 here from Tim Biko, covering basically everything happening in the core devs world. So there's a TLDR at the top here. You guys know all about the Kiln Merge testnet. I'm not gonna repeat myself there. Shanghai, the upgrade that's coming after the merge to, to the protocol, I've, I've talked about that a lot recently. Uh, work on an executable spec for Ethereum's execution layer is progressing nicely. Uh, next step is uh, harmonizing the execution layer and con consensus layer upgrade processes. This is kind of like the, the governance process there. And the protocol guild, which I've talked about a lot lately, uh, is kind of like covered in this. So I, I definitely recommend giving this kind of post the read. The protocol guild is something that I really want more people to kind of like pay attention to. And the TLDR is that it's an initiative being spun up by uh, a few different people. Trent Van Epps is leading this in order to basically uh, get more kind of like money into the hands of public goods, not just Ethereum core developers, but public goods kind of like in general, right? It can be layer one core developers, it can be layer two, it can be people building tools, it can be anything basically. Um, and the way that that could be done is getting all the kind of like projects with, that build on Ethereum to give just 1% of their treasury to uh, the protocol guild and then the protocol guild kind of disperses this out to the relevant people. I, this It's funny because like we've had stuff like this in the past. I mean, Gitcoin is obviously an example of something like this, especially with the matching rounds. Uh, the DAO was like a, was pretty much a, um, an attempt at this, um, but as a for-profit version where a token w was issued and then as the DAO invested in projects, the token would, would logically go up in value because it had uh, a claim on those tokens, all that sort of stuff. But the Protocol Guild, as far as I understand it, is trying to be a non-profit kind of like venture. It's just trying to align incentives here and get more people kind of like donating to core developers um, and get, you know, get these projects to kind of like give back to the developers that are actually keeping the network alive. So... I definitely recommend that more people pay attention to the protocol guild here. I think it's very important. Uh, as I said, you can read this blog post. It's got all the details in it, but uh, it's also got links to learn more about all of that stuff as well. So this will be linked in the YouTube description for you to go check out. So there's been a, a bit of talk recently about uh, this girly shadow fork that happened recently uh, with regards to the merge. So what this is, and Ben Edgington has a great ex explanation of what the shadow fork is here. Uh, so basically... Shadow forks are basically uh, uh, where they take the state of an existing network, so the state of Girly, for example, and mirror it onto a merged proof of stake network. This means that the transactions from the real network can be replayed onto the shadow network as they occur. The Girly network or shadow fork today, today being I think the 25th of March is when um, uh, Ben put out this update, and there are plans to repeat this every couple of weeks. Uh, due to transaction ordering issues, the two networks gradually get out of sync, so the shadow needs to be reinitialized every now and again for maximum effectiveness. Now. Why would you want to do this? Well, you want to be able to see what um, what kind of like a, uh, a merge network kind of like looks like, merge proof of stake network looks like using, I guess, real testnet transactions. Now, this is not the testnets uh, being kind of like merged. You know, that's coming up next. Like the Gurley, Robston, Coban, all those kind of like testnets there, they're being um, forked eventually uh, and they're going through the merge transition process. This is just like shadow forks that individuals or teams are kind of like spinning up in order to kind of like, I guess, do more testing, do more simu simulating here. As I said to you guys before, I think the main thing right now for the merge is just test, test, test. Make sure we catch all those edge case cases. Make sure we don't have a repeat a repeat of what happened with Kiln because what happened with, with, with the Kiln test net, especially with Prism producing invalid blocks, that wasn't a big deal for the Kiln test net because of the fact that uh, Prism didn't have a super majority. But as I stated before, if this happened on mainnet, it would have been like the worst case scenario. And this is what I've been talking about with regards to client diversity, where essentially uh, Prism being the super majority on, on the network, at least I think the last time I checked, they were, I, I think the latest stats from what I'm hearing uh, is, is, is kind of like showing that Prism is no longer the super majority, but let's just assume they still are. Um, if that happened on mainnet, uh, there would have been it, it would have been uh, pretty bad, right? It would have been basically a failed merge, essentially, uh, because of the fact that Prism has, has or had that supermajority there. Now, as I've said before, I think we can get to a point where no client has the supermajority leading up, leading into the merge. There's a lot of work being done on client diversity, guys, uh, both in in public and in the background. Uh, it's actually amazing to see kind of like the community come together and push this. I think mean, Superfears, as I mentioned before, has been an absolute champion at this. Get rallying all the right people contacting all the right people he's been really great about it but you know it's, it's really taken a whole community effort here from 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 you guys kind of like talking about it even if you just kind of uh, i guess put attention on it on on twitter or on the discord channel or anything like that and potentially you're running your own 
kind of like staking software and you're not running the, the majority client, you're actually running a, a minority client, you know, everything counts sort of thing. So I think there's a lot of positive kind of like work being done there. I think we're going to get below, I think Prism will will be below 66% at least by the merge, which, which is the super majority threshold. If we can get it under 60%, that would be what, um, amazing. We're going to have to see what the staking service providers do. Obviously Coinbase and Kraken account for a large set of the stakers and they're basically using all Prism. I think... From, uh, from from what I've seen, they seem to be more open now than they were to changing their clients. So I actually think this is going to be a really cool thing once that plays out and seeing them kind of like get off the, the majority client, get onto the minority ones. And then as they spin up new kind of, I guess, uh, validated clients, they stop spinning up the the the, the um the kind of like uh, the majority one and they go for the minority ones there. So yeah, these shadow forks are a cool thing to keep to keep paying attention to, see how they kind of like play along. Uh, but yeah, there's plenty of these and there's also a lot of uh, merge dev nets happening as well. Uh, and just on, on the note of Ben's newsletter here, he published his latest What's New in ETH2. Nice, healthy and chunky one. I suggest giving it a read. As I mentioned plenty of times before, guys, if you want to keep up with ETH2, this is the newsletter that you need to subscribe to. There is really nothing else that is as comprehensive as Ben's newsletter here for keeping you up to date with ETH2, with all the kind of like stuff happening in the wider Ethereum roadmap. Honestly, without this, I'd be completely lost, <laughs> to be honest. Like, it's just amazing all the kind of like updates he, he can fit into this and he covers so much stuff. Like, I think I'm across the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, especially kind of like the the, um, the protocol ecosystem, but no, I mean, Ben, uh, has has me beat there that's for sure but it's good because I, he kind of like produces this for free gives it gives all the information out there for us to kind of enjoy so i'll link this in the youtube description for you to check out as well all right so pseudo theos there's two tweets that i wanted to highlight from them today so one of them was uh this simple one where they said zk rollups are the most significant blockchain innovation since smart contracts i Totally agree with this. I, I still think, I've said this plenty of times, but I still think the majority of people in crypto are underestimating just how important ZK technology is. I guess not just in the roll-up context, but just as a kind of like broader thing, not just for scalability, but also privacy. Uh, but like even beyond that, right? There are use cases that we haven't even come up with yet that can kind of... Um, they can kind of play a part here. And as I said before, there are so many teams working on ZK stuff now, billions of dollars worth of kind of research and development going into this sort of stuff that it really is quite amazing to see. I mean, you know, just the layer twos alone, just in the scalability front, not even the privacy front are making just massive strides. We saw ZK Sync the other week go live with their ZK EVM test nets. Um, you know, I have a tweet here from Polygon teasing that there's two massive product releases coming up shortly. And they said Polygon's multi-chain Ethereum ecosystem is about to explode. Look, I don't like you guys know I'm an advisor to Polygon, but I don't have any special insight here. I'm going to assume that this has got something to do with their zk stuff. Maybe they have a zk EVM testnet going live as well. So yeah, there's just so much stuff happening here, guys. It's actually insane, and that's just the scalability front. Then there's the privacy front, where where Aztec Protocol is doing a lot of great work here. Um, there's a bunch of other projects out there as well, kind of like incorporating ZK stuff into, into their kind of like privacy tools. And, and really you guys know that, that, that two of the things that I really focus on or main things that I focus on within the Ethereum ecosystem is privacy and scalability, because I think without those things, we were never going to achieve mass adoption. And they're both being worked on in parallel using similar technologies as well. So we're going to continue to see this Cambrian explosion. It is just as innovative and just as important, uh, just, uh, since smart contracts came to be like, I always talk about zero to one innovations within crypto. You don't get them very often, but when you do, it's actually magical. I mean, smart contracts were a zero to one in in innovation for blockchains. There's no denying that. Uh, and I think ZKP, zero knowledge proofs in general, are a zero to one innovation for the blockchain ecosystem, but just for computing in general, I think. Um, and, and, you know, it's just going to take us to the next level of where we want to be and, and kind of, I guess, some... Um, uh, get us uh, uh, get us there with scalability and privacy. So very much looking forward uh, forward, to, forward to that. So I just wanted to highlight that from Pseudo Theos. And another tweet from them, at, that, which is uh, going to be a little bit of a, a rant here, but this was a good tweet. Pseudo Theos says, uh, how to make twenty two? How to make a twenty two point seven billion dollar protocol in twenty twenty two? Step one: fork geth. Step two: crank up throughput. Step three: attach blockchains to the main blockchain while exclaiming that L twos are too complex. Step four: advertise in subway stations. Step five: say you sco solved the scalability trilemma. Now, obviously, Pseudo Theos is talking about the Avalanche uh, ecosystem blockchain, whatever you want to call it here. You guys know I'm not a big fan of, of Avalanche. I do give credit to some of the other layer ones out there that are doing stuff differently. So, you know, Solana, for example, is not just a straight kind of like Ethereum fork. They're actually doing stuff differently, even though I believe that Solana's architecture is not long-term sustainable and that, that it's basically centralized. 
at least, at least. Like if I had to give them something, at least they're doing something different here. But Avalanche, I mean, you could argue that, that I mean, I would argue that the only thing that's novel about them is the consensus mechanism. And honestly, I don't think that's enough. I don't think that's enough to consider something to be like a zero to one innovation as I as I mentioned before. Um, and really, what they have is literally just Ethereum with a higher gas limit um, and, 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 and faster blocks, which has sacrificed pretty much all decentralization in my eyes. And not only that, but their founders are constantly on Twitter gaslighting um, and kind of like spreading misinformation about layer twos. And, you know, if they weren't doing that, if they were actually living up to their kind of like, I guess, mantra of we're all in this together or good vibes only, as I've said before, I wouldn't really have an issue with it. But my issue with a lot of these other L1s is really the social layer at the end of the day. Like the tech is is bad, don't get me wrong. The tech is actually really bad and there's not really much happening there in terms of innovation. But it's the social kind of layer that I always, always look at. If you just run through kind of like all the alternative L1s or at least most of them, their social layers are really bad. I mean, look at Cardano, for example. Like, the, the, the Cardano fanboys defend that thing like it's the best thing ever. When, you know, the smart contracts went live and you, you saw that they could do barely any TPS, it was actually worse than Ethereum and it's still going nowhere. And on top of that, you have Charles Hodgkinson making fun of Ethereum, saying it's outdated technology, you know, DeFi is easy, all this sort of stuff. So again, social layer stuff. Avalanche, as I mentioned, both founders, uh, or, or I guess like... A, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how many founders there are, but like Kevin and Emin, um, which you've probably seen on Twitter a lot, they're always kind of like gaslighting, trash talking Ethereum, all this sort of stuff. And, and the irony is they're just using Ethereum. So that's just as funny. Um, Solana, same deal. Anatoly has done this before. He's gaslighted about L2s. He talks, he basically speaks in tongues. Like a lot of the time he speaks like a Web2 engineer, um, which isn't necessarily bad, but he also kind of like floods Ethereum a bit as well. I mean, I'm not going to go through them all here, but... It's just, it's it, it, it's kind of like, it, it feels weird. It's, it seems like a requirement for these alternative L1s that they have to kind of like give shit to Ethereum or kind of like point out Ethereum's flaws. And it's just hilarious that a lot of them are just uh, only able to be because they're sitting on the backs of Ethereum at the end of the day, especially something like Avalanche, which, I mean, they have the subnet thing coming out, which is literally just side chains. But the only thing they have today is the C chain. Um, the only thing that has any real use is the C chain, which, as I said, is is a direct geth fork. It is this, basically the same thing as using Ethereum, just without the decentralization, because they've they've they've, they've cram, cranked up the hardware requirements essentially by cranking up the gas limit and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, as I said, that was going to be a little bit of a rant there, guys, but it really is insane how much money can be made doing this sort of stuff. Um, and I wrote about this in the newsletter today, where I basically said. I don't believe the Avalanche ecosystem has given a cent back to Ethereum public goods or especially Ethereum core developers, even though they've made billions of dollars off of their work. Like, it's just, I mean, it comes back to the tra tragedy of the commons thing. This isn't just exclusive to crypto. In the Web2 world, you have a lot of open source software that is used by these massive billion dollar, trillion dollar companies, like, you know, companies like Microsoft and Apple. And as far as I know, a lot of the time they give barely anything, if anything, to the people that maintain this open source software. And it's just bizarre, right? Like you'd think that they'd give grants. Like what's a, what's a few million dollars in a grant or even like $10 million in a grant to uh, to a, th these open source developers that are building the software that these trillion, trillion dollar companies are using to improve their own products? Like what's that? And they still don't do it. I, I just, I, I don't understand. It really is bizarre. And, and the same is true for crypto because I mean, Apple, they're sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars worth of cash. Same with with other kind of like big tech companies out there and what they can't spare a few million, 10 million, 20, I mean, even like, you know, tens of million just to pay these open source people or give a grant to these open source developers that are maintaining this sort of stuff. And same goes for crypto. What the Avalanche ecosystem can't give money back to Ethereum core developers as thank you. Like uh, it's it's just, it's insane, right? Like, and as you guys know, I'm a really, really big proponent for public goods funding. I try to do as much of it my, myself as I can, but sadly I don't have, a, you know, a token that I'm, that I can shill and that I can dump and donate all the proceeds to core developers. You know, sometimes I think to myself, why don't I just kind of like issue a token and donate literally all the money I make from it to core developers? 
you know, I, I could do that, but again, but that opens up legal troubles, right? That opens up to everyone calling me a scammer, all these sorts of things. But I would truly do that. I mean, I did it with the NFT drop. I donated all the proceeds after I paid uh, the artist to core developers. I have no issue doing that. Um, but the problem is, is that I don't want to be called a scammer. I don't want to run into legal troubles around this. I don't want to issue a pointless token just to, uh, you know, donate the, the money. Maybe if you were tr totally transparent about it and basically said to people, hey, if you buy this token, you are literally throwing money away. It is worth nothing. It's literally worthless. It's not like the meme of a, of a valueless governance token. It's literally worthless. It does nothing. And, and maybe it doesn't have to be an ERC-20 token. Maybe it, has, it can be another NFT drop. Maybe I do a, you know, maybe in the future I do something else that's hyped up, right? That, and then I can donate, donate all the proceeds. But I don't think the point is that I think the point is is that people make billions of dollars off of other people's work and they don't even give even a small amount of that back and that's why initiatives like the protocol guild have gotten started and trying to kind of like change the change change kind of like the narrative here and change how projects approach this but yeah it, it just it's always insane to me that this kind of like stuff plays out and there's so many people making so much money and we can't even spare uh you know the money to pay these Kind of like uh, people that are that are building this software that is allowing for that to happen, and you know it goes back to what I, what we were discussing last week when uh, you know Peter brought up the the core developer funding, all that sorts of stuff. I think it goes way beyond salaries. It just goes to to the point where if you see your work copied and forked and endlessly, and people are making a shit ton of money off of it and you see nothing from it, it's disheartening, right? It really feels crappy, and I think that. We can change that with things like Protocol Guild, as I mentioned before. But it, 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 I think for the majority, especially these other L1s, they're not going to give anything back. I mean, why would they? They don't even have, they don't have a um, inclination to do that because the thing is, is that they can keep copying Ethereum. They can keep copying Ethereum upgrades like ERP-1559 without paying for them because Ethereum is still going to do upgrades. And that's the sad reality of it at the end of the day. But you know, we'll see. I'm really optimistic about Protocol Guild. I'm trying to get involved and trying to help with that. You know, I'm trying to put a spotlight on it. Uh, but it's not just that. Obviously, all the work that Gitcoin is doing, there's a lot of work that other people are doing. Um, I, I, I hope that the NFT space does more of this. You know, I saw a I saw a drop recently from, I think his name is X Copy. He made like 20 plus million dollars from an open edition that he did like really, really quickly. And as far as I know, he's not donating any of that to Ethereum public goods or anything. And I, I, just, I look at that and I'm like, come on, right? Like at least uh, some of it, like even if you don't donated 10% of it, $2 million, you're still left with $18 million. I know obviously you, you got to think about it after taxes and all that sorts of stuff, but still, I mean, when I when I kind of like see these large numbers, I'm like, this is just crazy. Like, we, we need to do a better job here, and I hope we can. And I'll keep advocating for this, and I'll keep doing what I can in order to kind of like give as much money back to the core developers as I can, can. But at the end of the day, I'm just one guy. You know, I don't have billions of dollars to, to give to people. I don't, I, you know, I don't I don't have even even tens of millions of dollars to to give to people. Um, but I I think that. It shouldn't just be reliant on one person or one ecosystem. It, sh it should be a whole kind of like crypto wide thing. And it shouldn't just be Ethereum. It should be like everyone building great open source, you know, novel, innovative tools. They should get the money that they deserve and the recognition that they deserve that comes with that as, as well. But anyway, end rant there. Last couple of things to get through before I end today's episode. So Polyna has a new blog post out called the Endgame Bottleneck Historical Storage. Now, Polynup uh, kind of put, put out this uh, this tweet where he says, in a previous post, I speculated that the final bottleneck is historical storage, but I didn't put a number on it. In the proto dank sharding FAQ, Vitalik mentions 500 terabytes a year is the point where it might get risky. Now, I highlighted this uh, dank shard, proto dank sharding FAQ last week for you guys to check out from Vitalik. It's also linked here if you want, in, in Polynup's tweet here, if you want to go check that out again. But I, I suggest reading this blog post because... I did mention one of Polyna's blog posts. Uh, uh, so this is this was the one that I mentioned from from Feb twenty seven. And this is the one kind of like Polyna linked here, but they've gone on to kind of like do a thought experiment in this Twitter thread, uh, uh, kind of like using those posts as context. So before reading their Twitter thread, I suggest reading Vitalik's kind of like FAQ here and also reading Polyna's blog post, but essentially putting numbers on on this sort of stuff is what Polyna's done in this thread. And I wanted to highlight for it. It's a, it's, a, it's a small thread. I want you to guys to check it out because this is what comes kind of like after we, not after, but like this is, this this is the end game bottleneck at the end of the day, this, this historical storage. And essentially what this means is like, how do we deal with all the data that's being stored on the Ethereum blockchain, right? Like obviously 
L2s are very data hungry. They want to store data. How do we deal with that in such a way that full nodes can still be synced and still be run on consumer hardware? And, you know, there's been a, a few different kind of like proposals out there that I've talked about before, like stateless Ethereum and, and history expiry and all these sorts of stuff and, 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 and kind of like other such such things there, which uh, Polina does cover a little bit here and, um, and Vitalik covers in his FAQ, I believe. But this is still kind of like, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's an open research problem in that we don't have like solutions, but it is still very much ongoing research. We don't know the the, the, the kind of like implementation that's going to go live in the Ethereum network, but we do know kind of like, or have a rough idea of where we want to get to, where we want to be when it comes to this sort of stuff. So definitely check out both of these posts and Polynar's thread. Uh, it's, it's very well worth it. I finally hear Roman from Tornado Cash uh, announced on Twitter that he is building a gas price extension for Chrome and Firefox that focuses on getting cheaper gas prices by waiting for base fee fluctuations. Kind of similar to how legacy gas estimated work, but developed specifically for EIP-1559. So uh, basically, uh, someone replied saying, I, you know, if you wanted a further explanation, yeah, someone replied saying, I don't understand the use case. I can just submit a transaction at whatever gas I want. Then Roman replied by saying, uh, if you submit with uh, with lower base fee than the current one, you can still get your transaction mined within five minutes, but around 30% cheaper. The base fee oscillates around an average value and you only need to catch a single dip to get your tra cheap transaction mined. Corey said, we're saying the same thing. And then Roman uh, continued and said, oh, I incorrectly understood your tweet at first. This extension will help you to estimate how long it will take at the price you set. When the price you set is too low, the transaction might take forever to get mined. So this is pretty helpful, I guess. Like the funny thing is with 1559, uh, since that's been live, I've barely had to speed up transactions uh, unless like I put my transaction in and then all of a sudden the base fee spikes because of the fact that some NFT mint is going on or something like that. Uh, it's just smoothed it a lot out. But uh, this is really cool. The fact that you can kind of like set a base fee and then it'll give you kind of like an estimation of of kind of like how long it's going to take for your transaction uh, uh, to get mined here. And this is built directly into an extension. I know Etherscan does this already, but I always like more tools that help people with, with, with gas things. And the funny thing is that this sort of stuff really, at the end of the day, only applies to layer one Ethereum. When it comes to layer twos, in the ideal scenario, you don't ever need this. You can just kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like have your transactions kind of gone through instantly because there's going to be enough scale to kind of support that. But I think, I mean, as the layer twos are still maturing, there's still a lot of activity happening on layer one. There's still a lot of you guys playing around with layer one. I'm still playing around with layer one. So this sort of stuff is is needed. And, you know, as I said, uh, it's, it's it's time to get on layer twos today, guys. Just speaking of layer twos, you know, the gas prices are always up, are already up to 30, 40 guay again. It was below 20 guay while we were kind of like um, calm there. But as the market continues to heat up, if we go over 4K ETH and we stay above that, we're pretty much going back to all time high, I think. And then when that happens, you know, guys, what happens to the wider crypto markets, it's going to go bananas and i expect to see 100 plus gray again so the best time to get on layer two was yesterday the second best time is today so definitely go and do that uh, uh while the gas is still cheap but also there are more and more fiat on ramps coming online there are more and more centralized exchange bridges coming online that are cheaper than directly bridging from layer one ethereum uh but still if you want like the most trustless way to bridge your assets in you definitely want to do it from from layer one ethereum uh uh there so Go and do that before gas spikes again uh, as the market continues to heat up. But I think uh, that's going to be it for today's episode. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.